Um, I'm going to give a quick rundown of what this looks like from the Mesopotamian side. Um, mm. And then if you want to, I, I know because you have a system, Vedic astrology is very complicated. Um, so I don't know if you'd be able to give us any insight just based on this. And then Nikki, I'd like to um, hear your take on it too. And obviously anybody watching has the love and joy and privilege <laughs> of hearing three different astrologers takes on these things all at once, which is um, probably pretty cool. So uh, what's going on right now? And I'm going to, not too much is going to change between now and next week when we're looking at the uh, 15th between the next time that we talk. Hold on, let me see. So I got 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I guess maybe we could say Mercury is going to already be transiting into Libra. I would still call, I think Venus is going to be right there on the cusp. I don't think it's going to matter too much for reasons that I'm about to explain. If I go silent for a second, you guys, I'm coughing and I apologize. All right, so here's this cool comment that we talked about last week. Uh, we talked about actually in the spring when we were, um, Pat brought it up. We were talking, we were doing the ancient astrology course. I have, honestly, we would not, we can't see this comment, you guys. There's, we can't. We can see it with a program. Um, this is not something that like our ancestors would have known anything about, but it is interesting to see. We do have this conjunction right here with the sun. I believe this is going to run us up the really um, intense part. It's already kind of circling away out here into um, like late next week. But when we're looking at any, if, you know, comets are having some sort of crazy impact on anything, this is the time to pay attention to. Um, but does it matter if we're not seeing it? I don't know. I don't have an answer for anybody out there. Uh, but what we do have right now, we have this nice, beautiful conjunction with the sun and Mercury. I do call these a conjunction, even though they're not right on top of each other. Um, these are going to be right close to Spica. Now, um, just beneath, now we see this a little bit with Corvus. Um, in Mesopotamia, there was a constellation down here known as the Crow. It was associated with the Dodd. He was embodied um, in the planet Mercury. So this is a really strong placement. So anybody who's like, oh yeah, Mercury, you know, being in Virgo, that's like a good placement. Well, technically it is at least down here uh, in Mesopotamia. Now, Mercury, even though, yes, we have the traditional Mercurian traits, learning and, you know, cognitive everything. Um, in Mesopotamia, this was a water planet and it was associated with the fertile rains and creativity, um, curiosity. Like it was a power planet, but Mercury in the Babylonian Amina tradition had the ability to either uh, hold back the floods or you know, cause lots of flooding, which they needed in Mesopotamia because that's like their whole livelihood and life was based on um, the flood waters, uh, being able to, you know, water their crops and everything. So Spica in particular is going to be a health and wealth star. As a matter of fact, in Mesopotamia, Virgo was a health and wealth constellation. It was actually two constellations, one woman standing here, one over here. They were known as the furrow and the frond. And over time, they were kind of just crammed in together. It doesn't really matter. Um, they were basically an aspect of a goddess known as Ninhursang. She is the oldest named in human history as far as we have in writing. She's the oldest named mother goddess. She was synonymous with the earth. And so we have a lot of, um, obviously like a lot of mother earth connotations here. Um, as I mentioned before, when I was talking, uh, there is overlap with Lakshmi. Uh, I think this is really important to understand because in Hinduism, Lakshmi, um, one of the names for her, uh, epithets, if you will, is Maya, which is basically illusion. And we talk about Lakshmi being like the illusory, um, material universe that we live in on like a, from a scientific standpoint, that's the actual material stuff of the cosmos. But, um, from a more spiritual standpoint, we're looking at like, it's the manifestation of consciousness. And so there is this, um, it's like all encompassing, you know, uh, space, science, time and space. So you do get a lot of it, it uh, People with strong Virgo traits, they often do have a really strong connection to nature, the sciences and stuff like that. So I just like to generalize, call it like a health and wealth constellation. Now with Mercury over here and the sun, um, in Mesopotamia, the sun is going to kind of calm some of the Mercury traits down a little bit, um, where it can be very, very cognitive and maybe overly rational and logical and just like way too in the head. The sun's going to come in, um, swoop in and kind of uh, temper that a little bit and um, maybe bring in some intuition. But in Mesopotamia, the sun was Utu Shamash. He will, if you look him up, it's going to say, oh, he was, um, uh, he, he was a god of law and justice. 
but none of his myths actually deal with that. And all of his myths, he's either guiding or protecting, talking his sister Venus off the ledge. Um, so this is obviously, you guys know, anybody watching this, I pray to God you understand that every year the sun goes into Virgo. It's not anything unusual. And Mercury is usually nearby at the same time. So this is not any type of earth shattering anything. But generally speaking, um, Virgo, if you're in the northern hemisphere, this is going to be more, you know, fall type of thing. Um, so we do have like a more harvest festivals. We have a Diwali coming up and, you know, stuff like that. Um, but what's interesting is when you combine these um, with some of the other things going on, uh, Venus, who in Mesopotamia was a Nana Ishtar, she was the goddess of love, beauty, fertility, sexuality, and uh, war and victory. Depending on where she's at, she could um, cause some problems. But here in Libra, these were the claws of the scorpion. They were um, just a, they were just an aspect of the scorpion. This whole figure, Scorpio, was Tashmetu. Um, she was, uh, or excuse me, no, this was, my brain's melting. Um, Ishara, she was known as a Ishara of the ocean. And when you get down to it, she was really just an aspect of Inanna Ishtar Venus. So, um, either Scorpio or Venus are going to be a really nice placement for Venus in Mesopotamia. Um, this was technically, we could call this a social constellation, but really it was about the marketplace. Um, many of the, uh, omens relating to Libra were, um, all about the prices of oil. This is a very strong financial placement. Um, now, while Venus does bring a lot of, uh, it improves some of the relationships. It can soften some relationships. Obviously, unless you're in some toxic relationships, it's going to cause some of that stuff to fester and you're going to have to deal with it. Um, but this is can be an interesting time uh, financially. There are some uh, potential for some wild fluctuations. I... Aside from this one weird week here that we're dealing with this comet, I do think that the sun and um, Mercury around Spica while Venus is here, I think that's going to do us some favors and we're going to maybe dodge out of some massive um, potentially, you know, we could have some financial upsets and everything. So I don't really think that that's going to be an issue. Obviously, Saturn's still in Aquarius, has been for a while. Jupiter's still making its way through the Hyades to this uh, middle point, but I would still say this is a very creative placement. Mars and Gemini in Mesopotamia, this is going to be a very empathic, very sensitive um, type of placement as it starts to swing into Cancer. This was the uh, location of the entrance, one of the entrances to the underworld in Mesopotamia. Um, this can intensify some of the Mars, some sensitivity. This this could, depending on people's individual charts, their, you know, the chart of your country, as you guys know, again, I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, this could potentially be make things really hard for people because they get really, really sensitive. Um, so, okay, I've rambled quite enough. Uh, Gary, do you want to, do you want to take a stab at this? Do you feel comfortable without looking at like, um, you know, without looking at my box chart? Yeah, 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 like yeah, box yeah. Do you need in. some squares? Like, do you, what do you want? Uh, I, need, I need a few squares. Oh my God, it's too open. It's too open. Yeah. Um, no, no, it's good. But I, what, what I might say about that, just to kind of um, correlate it with the Indian system is obviously to talk about the, the lunar mansions, the nakshatras. So maybe just talk about the sun there in Chitra, which is correlates with Spica. So actually, and just to mention that what, the Chitra Paksha Ayanamsha is the Chitra is the lunar is the star constellation there, right? But it's the star Spica. That's how we calculate zero degrees of Aries, opposite Spica. That's how okay. we calculate the Ayanamsha according to Chitra Paksha Ayanamsha, it's called. So that's just one thing. So the sun obviously going through this constellation of Chitra, which is a, a, a lunar mansion that is symbol is a jewel or a pearl so it's all about design and perfection you know and it bridges both virgo and libra in the indian system and it's actually half and half split evenly between both virgo and libra so when you think about that it's kind of very much about uh, creating something like designing something is very is related to design in a big way as well and the deity that rules it is all about like, the divine architect, essentially. So it's all about designing something. But then in Libra, it's more about sharing that. It's like, you know, when you make something perfect, but then it's it's no good unless you share it with someone. Uh, which is another reason why to think about Venus in its, its, its Virgo section as opposed to Libra, where, yeah, you can design something that's beautiful, and, but then you're going to see a lot of the flaws as you're doing that, trying to perfect it. Right. But then as soon as you give it to someone, as soon as you share it, as soon as you put it on stage, 
like the Libra side of it. It's kind of, it's, it's in, enjoyable. Venus loves being in Libra for that reason. So that's why I would say also maybe just one other last thing um, you mentioned here about Libra and Venus in Libra right now and this weighing of the scales. And we talk about in Indian astrology, the Vishaka lunar mansion, which is the symbol is the scales literally, but um, another symbol that's used is the um, archway, the wedding archway, you know, the decorated wedding archway that people use. And so it's kind of, it's a very sort of like initiatory and also very much a journey that we go into like a portal almost. And it's symbol also ties in with this, Vishaka literally means two branched as well. And that's the whole kind of Libra kind of dynamic, kind of weighing up things. And do I want to go this way or that way? And, you know, Libras are known for that kind of maybe indecisiveness many times, but also eventually when you do decide on a path on whatever it is, it eventually then becomes Scorpio and Vishaka is mostly in Libra, but there's a one section of it, one Pada, like I said, there was four sections in each of these. One of these sections is in Scorpio. So it's mostly in Libra. So it's all about kind of weighing up the pros and cons and which will I decide. But then it's also in Scorpio where it's like, I've decided now and I'm going to dedicate myself to this. And then it becomes Scorpio. Then it becomes like fixed on something like almost, or maybe even obsessive about it as well eventually. But that's the journey from Libra to Scorpio in terms of the lunar mansions as well.